Hey everybody, and welcome to a video on some basic rules of probability. Recall that in the last video, we, know, we went over the three main axioms of probability theory, what we called the Kolmogorov axioms. Let's review those. Kolmogorov axioms. The first recall was non-negativity. According to this axiom, the probability of any arbitrary proposition x is non-negative, so it's greater than or equal to zero so for all x. The second requirement was normality, that the probability of any arbitrary tautology, which I'll write as t, is equal to one. And then the final requirement was additivity. that the probability of a disjunction A or B is equal to the sum of the probabilities of the individual disjuncts. So probability of A plus probability of B if A and B are mutually exclusive. Recall that means that their conjunction is a contradiction. So they can't both be true. At most, one of them could be true. All right, so these were axioms. Now, technically, we're being a little loose here in calling these the Kolmogorov axioms. Since his axioms were a bit stronger and that they entailed the principle known as countable additivity, that's a stronger version of our additivity axiom. It's assumed in most mathematical treatments of probability, but this only makes a difference in the context of infinite probability spaces, where we're effectively dealing with an infinite number of different propositions. And all the examples we'll consider in, this, consider in this course will be entirely finite. So that won't really make a difference for our purposes. Okay, so now in this video, we're going to derive a few handy rules that follow from these axioms that we can then use to compute the probabilities of different propositions going forward in this course. All right, so the first rule I want to derive, we'll call these propositions. Well, this proposition one, we could call this the uh, contradiction rule. And it tells us how to find the probability of a contradiction. The rule is basically that if you have any arbitrary contradiction, f, its probability is zero. Right? That's the rule. Now, why is that true? Why do we know that the probability of any contradiction has to be zero, given our axioms? Well, we can prove it pretty straightforwardly. Right? The key thing to note is first that the tautology or any tautology disjuncted with a contradiction is equivalent to, logically equivalent, just write logically equivalent, to just a tautology, right? If we were to think about this right in a truth table, and we had a row was for a tautology in a row that was for a contradiction, right? We, you know, don't know how big this truth table is, but we know that the tautology column would have all trues, and we know that the contradiction column would have all falses. Right? So if we consider their disjunction, tautology or contradiction, we know that, right, in order for this column to get a true, it suffices for either of its disjuncts to get a true. And since tautology is always true, this column will always be true as well. So this shows, right, that a tautology disjuncted with a contradiction is a tautology. In fact, a tautology disjuncted with any proposition is a tautology. All right. So that means that by normality, we know its probability, right? We know the probability of t or f is just one. Right? Now also note that a contradiction is mutually exclusive with respect to any other proposition, including the tautology, right? Because a contradiction and a tautology can never both be true for the simple reason that a contradiction can never be true. So since they're mutually exclusive, that means we can employ the additivity axiom and say that this is really equal to the probability of a tautology plus the probability of a contradiction. But we know that the probability of a tautology is one. So this is really one plus 
probability of f. Now we can just subtract 1 from both sides, and we get that the probability of f is equal to 0. Okay, which is what we wanted to show. So any contradiction has to get zero probability attached to it. Now the next thing we're going to derive is what we might call the negation rule. I'll call this proposition two negation rule. This tells us how to find the probability of a negation given that we know the probability of the proposition being negated. And the rule says basically the probability of not x equals 1 minus the probability of x for any proposition x. Okay, So again, we can derive this from our axioms. So the trick here is to note that any proposition disjuncted with its negation is a tautology. So, right, x or not x is a tautology. x or not x is a tautology. But that means by normality, we know what its probability has to be. It has to be 1. So we know 1 is the probability of x or not x. But of course, x and its negation are mutually exclusive with respect to one another, so we can employ additivity. It tells us that the probability of x or not x is equal to the probability of x plus the probability of not x. Then if we subtract the probability of x from both sides, we get probability of not x is equal to 1 minus the probability of x, which is what we wanted to show. Right? So now we know, right, if, the, if we know the probability of some proposition x is, say, 0.6, then we know the probability of its negation has to be 1 minus that, or 0.4. Right? All right, the next rule we can derive is what I'll call the logical equivalence rule. So proposition 3 logical equivalence rule. And this rule says that if two propositions, A and B, right, are logically equivalent, right, remember that means that if we were to draw a truth table and have a column for both A and B, we would see that their columns look identical. So if A and B are logically equivalent, then the probability of A has to be equal to the probability of B. Logically equivalent propositions have to get the same probability attached to them. Right? Again, this follows from our axioms. Right? Well, let's show this by letting A and B be logically equivalent propositions or statements. Now, we then know, right, that I claim that A or not B is a tautology. Right? Why is this the case? Well, if we think here, right, imagine we drew a truth table. We had a column for A and a column for B. You know, who knows what this looks like? Maybe it's true, true, false, false, true, whatever, right? Who knows how big the truth table is and so on. But What's important here is that we know that A and B are logically equivalent, so they have to get the same um, entries in their truth table columns, right? So B has to look just like A, right? But then if we consider the negation of B, right, it's just going to reverse that. It'll be the opposite of whatever B is, and hence also the opposite of whatever A is, right? But then if we look at a disjunction between A and the negation of B, we're going to see that that'll always be true because either A will be true or its negation, which is equivalent to the negation of B, will be true. So this ends up being a tautology everywhere. Right? Okay, so hopefully that at least sort of gives you the intuition or convinces you that uh, A or not B really is a tautology when A and B are logically equivalent to each other. Now, since they're a tautology, that means by normality we know what their probability is. It has to be 1. So 1 equals the probability of A or not B. Now, of course, A and not B are also going to be mutually exclusive with each other in this case. So we can apply additivity and get that this is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of not B. Now, we can apply the negation rule that we just showed was valid. 
which tells us the probability of not B is equal to 1 minus the probability of B. So this equals probability of A plus 1 minus probability of B. Now, I can subtract 1 from both sides, and then add B to both sides, and our probability of B to both sides, and I'll get probability of A equals probability of B, which is what we wanted to show, right? They have to have the same probability attached to them. All right, next principle we can derive is what's sometimes called monotonicity. This is a principle that we assumed on one of our homework assignments already, actually, but now we're going to show it follows from the axioms. Uh, the claim here is that if A entails B, logically, then the probability of A has to be less than or equal to the probability of B. So by ordering propositions according to their logical strength, we're also ordering them according to their epistemic probability. We can note that B, the logically weaker proposition, is really logically equivalent to A or not A and B. So we could show this we could show this through drawing a truth table. We could illustrate that these two are going to be logically equivalent to one another. You could also write just gain intuition for it maybe by thinking about a Venn diagram here, where we have right this is our this square represents our space of possibilities, and maybe this big circle represents B, logically weaker proposition. And some internal region of it represents the logically stronger proposition A, right? We could think of, right, B is going to be equivalent to A, right? When we're saying that we're in B, we're saying we're either in A, somewhere in here, or we're not in A, but we are in B, right? So we're not A and B, we're out here, right? Maybe that gives you some intuition, at least drawing these pictures often gives me a sort of intuition for um, what propositions are going to be logically equivalent to which. But of course, right, if we want to really check it, we could draw a truth table. And that actually might be a good exercise for you to do in preparation for um, studying for the exam on for, uh, this weekend. But I'm just going to take it that these are logically equivalent to one another, which means by the logical equivalence rule that they have to get the same probability attached to them. So probably B equals probably A or not A and B, but A and not A and, and B are mutually exclusive with one another, right? They couldn't both be true, right? Because one of them has A being true and the other disjunct has not A being true. So we can apply or, or apply additivity and we get this is equal to probability of A plus probability of not A and B. Now what we see here is that we have the probability of B is equal to the probability of A plus some other probability. Now, non-negativity, right, guarantees this probability is going to be some non-negative number. So we're saying probability B is equal to probability of A plus some non-negative number, right? That means probability B has to be at least as big as probability of A, right? So probability of A is then less than or equal to probability of B, which is what we wanted to show. Okay, the next proposition I want to look at is a version of what's known as the law of total probability. So proposition five, the law of total probability. In order to state this principle, we need to introduce the notion of a logical partition. So let's define what a logical partition is, right? A logical Partition is a set of propositions, exactly one of which must be true. Right? Of propositions or statements 
exactly one of which must be true as a matter of logic, right? Right. So here, right, we could think of some examples of partitions, right? The simplest sorts of partitions are going to be stuff like a proposition and its negation, right? So A and not A. This is a partition because exactly one of those has to be true as a matter of logic, right? Um, it's raining and it's not, and then the proposition is not raining, right? Those two together would form a partition. So partitions come up in the statement of the law of total probability because they say that if, right, a, let's say, a1 through a n is a partition of propositions, then the probability of any arbitrary proposition x is going to be equal to the sum of the probability of x conjoined with each of the members of this partition. Okay? Now, why is this true, right? So we're sort of, we're breaking x up into all these different components. You can get a good intuition for why this sort of thing would be true from, again, looking at a sort of uh, uh, geometric representation here, where maybe we have, right, x is some arbitrary proposition. Right, um, a partition, right? You can think of as separating out this whole space into different regions, um, like maybe you know, if we had one one partition that was just A. Maybe this whole region here is A, and this whole region is not A. Right? Then what the law of total probability is saying is that we can view the probability of X in terms of the probability of X and A, added to the probability of X and not a, right? So it's sort of intuitive from looking at uh, a picture, but let's show that we can derive it from the axioms. All right, proof. So we let a one through a n be a partition. Now, we know then that x, any proposition x, is going to be logically equivalent to the following disjunction, x and a1, or x and a2, or so on through x and a n. Right. Um, we can use we could use truth tables to try to convince us of ourselves. Hopefully, the picture also gave us some sense of why this um, sort of disjunction would be true. Right. But if if we take it to be true that these really are logically equivalent to one another, then we know that by the logical equivalence rule, the probability of x has to equal the probability of this whole disjunction, x a one, or x a two, or so on, up to x. A n. But now note that right since the a1 through a n form a partition, it means that each disjunct within this disjunction has to be mutually exclusive with um, each other disjunct, right? Because, for example, this first disjunct requires a1 being true. But we know that a1 can't be true if a2 or a3 or any of the other a n's are true. So x and, and a1 can't be true if x and a2 is true, right? And so on. Oh, I should be clear here too, right? I'm, right, I'm violating our notation a little bit. I've been writing uh, conjunction as just two propositions next to each other. So I've been writing x and a um, as just x next to a. But right, in our notation that we're using in the skirms book, this is really right, x and a, right? So we've been a little more, more appropriate given our notation for me to have put in and signs here, uh, but that just makes it a little more cluttered. So I just uh, followed different notation and wrote them next to each other. Okay, 
So since these are all mutually exclusive with one another, these disjuncts, we can apply additivity. It's actually repeated application, several repeated applications of additivity to get xa1 plus probability of xa2 plus so on to probability of xan. All right. So, but this is right. This is exactly what we wanted to prove, right? This is just the sum of the x, a, i. All right. Just the law of total probability. All right. Now, I want the next proposition I want to derive is what's known as the general disjunction rule. General disjunction rule. Um, and this rule is going to help us find the probabilities of disjunctions when we know the probabilities that are disjunct. Now, we know that if two propositions are mutually exclusive, then additivity tells us how to find the probability of their disjunction. The general disjunction rule is going to tell us how to find the probability of a disjunction regardless of whether or not the disjuncts are mutually exclusive with one another. So what the rule says is that the probability of a disjunction, A or B, is equal to the probability of A, plus the probability of B, minus the probability of A and B. Okay? Now, note that this will coincide with the additivity axiom in the special case when A and B are mutually exclusive, right? Because in that case, A and B over here is going to be a contradiction, right? If A and B are mutually exclusive. But contradictions have zero probability. So then if we're effectively just taking off zero, which leaves us with probability of A or B equals probability of A plus probability of B, which is exactly what the additivity axiom said, right? So in the case of mutually exclusive propositions, this will agree with the additivity axiom, but it's more general because it works even if A and B are not mutually exclusive, right? And again, we can get some sort of intuition for why this would be true with thinking in terms of a picture, right? Maybe this is, this circle represents the A proposition and this circle represents the B proposition, right? We wanted to find the probability of their disjunction, A or B, Right, so we would want to take the probability of A and add it on to the probability of B, right? And if they were mutually exclusive, right, that is if there was no overlap between them, that would be fine. But as we can see, right, since there's overlap here, when we add, when we just add up the probabilities directly, we're double counting, right, all this stuff in the middle, A and B. It gets counted twice. So we need to subtract that off once to correct, right? And that leaves us with our equation up here. So hopefully that gives you some intuition. Now let's let's try to derive it from the axiom. Okay, proof. So the first thing to note is that A or B is really logically equivalent to the following proposition. A or B and not A. Now we could draw out a truth table to show that this is the case. Um, you could also think of it in terms of a picture again, and get some intuition at least for why these are logic equivalent, right? We again have our A circle and our B circle, right? We're saying that A or B, the whole thing, is equivalent to A, right? This one over here, or the part of B that's not A. Right? And you see this gives us the same region as A or B. Right? But again, right, if we wanted to check it, we could use truth tables. So we know these are logical equivalents, so by the logical equivalence rule, they have to get the same probability. Right? Probability of A or B is equal to probability of A or B and not A. But, of course, A and B and not A are mutually exclusive with one another, right? One has A being true and one has not A being true. So we can apply the good old additivity axiom to get that this is the probability of A plus the probability of B and not A. Okay? Now, right, we're going to note that A, note A and not A form a partition. So, by the law of total probability, the probability of any proposition, in this case I'll take B, right, is going to be equal to 
probability of B and A plus the probability of B and not A. Right? That's just the law of total probability. Separating out B into um, parts using this proposition A, or excuse me, using this partition A and not A. All right. Well, now look what we have up here. We have um, the uh, probability. We can rearrange this so we get probability of B and not A is equal to the probability of B minus the probability of B and A. Again, I'm, I'm sort of uh, uh, violating our notation a bit because I'm, I'm leaving out some of the and signs. Um, um, but hopefully that's, not, hopefully that's not too confusing. All right, so now we know the probability of B and not A is equal to the probability of B minus the probability of B and A. So now let's go back and let's substitute this in to uh, up here. Right? So then that would give us that the probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of B and A, or we could write it as A and B, right? Which is exactly what we wanted to show, right? So now we know in general, right, how to find the probability of a disjunction. You add up the probability of its disjuncts, and you subtract off the probability of their conjunction. All right, so these are all the rules that we're going to um, prove in this video. In the next video, we'll look at some examples using cards to get some practice with actually computing probabilities. So please complete the participation poll for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.